intrauterine contraception. So intrauterine contraception refers to a device inserted in the uterine cavity to provide contraception. It is a LARC method of contraception, which stands for long-acting reversible contraception. And there are two main types of intrauterine devices, the hormonal IUDs and copper IUDs, and we shall be discussing these in turn. So starting off with the hormonal IUD. So first of all, these IUDs contain the progestogen levonorgestrel, and in fact also referred to as the levonorgestrel intrauterine system, or LNG IUS for short. So let's take a closer look at the device itself. So we've got a T-shaped polyethylene frame with the hormone reservoir, as we said, containing von Ergestrel around the vertical stem. Now, several devices are available on the market, which are all slightly different. Here we shall be discussing three options. The Myrena, JDS, and Levocert intrauterine devices. The Myrena releases 20 micrograms of LNG daily. In 2024, when this video was created, it is currently licensed for eight years as a form of contraception. It is also a first-line treatment for heavy menstrual bleeding, licensed for five years, however, and can also be used as the progestogenic component in hormone replacement therapy. It is also used in the treatment of endometrial hyperplasia and endometriosis. The JDES releases 6 micrograms of LNG daily. It is licensed for 3 years as a form of contraception and is the smallest in terms of size of these three options. Therefore, it tends to be preferred in nulliparous women who have a smaller cervical loss. Levocert releases 20 micrograms of LNG daily. It is licensed for 3 years and can also be used to treat heavy menstrual bleeding. So as you can see, the Myrena has multiple non-contraceptive uses. However, the other two are only licensed for contraception. Now, how do these hormone IUDs work? So first and foremost, its primary contraceptive effect is by preventing implantation from taking place. It does this by causing endometrial atrophy and changes to the endometrial stroma. The hormone IUD also alters cervical mucus preventing sperm penetration, and can also inhibit ovulation from taking place. However, we do know that more than 75% of women with the Myrena still continue to ovulate. And this is going to be an important point when looking at the complications later on. Next up, we've got the copper IUD. The copper IUD comes in different shapes and sizes. Most consist of a T-shaped plastic frame wrapped in a copper wire. The most effective devices contain 380 mm squared of copper and have copper banded arms in addition to the stem, like these two options here. The copper IUD offers contraception for 5 to 10 years, depending on the type of device. And the copper IUD can also be used as a form of emergency contraception and is the most effective form of emergency contraception. Another video coming up on emergency contraception soon. So how does the copper IUD work? So it primarily works by inhibiting fertilization from taking place, as the copper ions are toxic to both the sperm and ova. The copper IUD also blocks implantation from taking place, as it has an inflammatory reaction in the endometrium. Good, so next, let's talk about their failure rates. So both of them are highly effective methods of contraception. The LNG IUS has a failure rate of 0.2%, while the copper IUD has a failure rate of 0.8%. Therefore, for both options, we are saying that they are effective in more than 99% of the times, which is excellent. Interestingly, if we had to look at the failure rate of a female sterilization procedure where the tubes are blocked, this is still not 100% effective and has a failure rate of 0.5%. Therefore, we should appreciate the great advantage of the von Ergestrel intrauterine system, which offers a better failure rate without needing to undergo a more major procedure, as well as being very easily reversible. Now, let's have a look at the advantages. So, as we've just said, IUDs are a highly effective form of contraception. 
They are also associated with high compliance and in fact are sometimes referred to as a fit and forget method of contraception. They are also very cost effective as you are paying for the costs of the device and insertion just once, which will last you in some cases for 8 to 10 years. Your bill at the end of this 8 to 10 year duration will be very different if you had to compare it to the OCP, for example. The IUD is also easily reversible, as once it is removed, there is no delay in return to fertility. There are also only a few contraindications associated with these devices, as we shall see later on. And as we've already mentioned, there are multiple non-contraceptive benefits associated with the Myrena, and the copper coil can be used as a form of emergency contraception. Next, it is advantages, so most commonly, IUDs can cause abnormal uterine bleeding. Heavier bleeding and intermenstrual bleeding are common with the copper coil, especially in the first three to six months. It usually settles with time. Women with a hormonal IUD may experience some spotting. Again, this is the most common in the first three to six months and then usually settles. 65% of hormonal IUD users will have light bleeding or be completely amenorrheic, that is, have no bleeding. Having said that, abnormal bleeding is the most common reason for removing intrauterine contraception. The formation of ovarian cysts may occur with the hormonal IUD. These are small follicular cysts, which are usually asymptomatic and not clinically significant, and resolve spontaneously. In the clinic, we hear many women concerned about hormonal side effects when offered the Myrena, such as weight gain, acne, mood swings, etc. However, evidence shows that there is no significant difference in these symptoms between the hormonal IUD and non-hormonal copper IUD. Therefore, these are not significant side effects. Now, in some cases, the IUD can fall out spontaneously, and this is referred to as expulsion. It often occurs if the woman experiences very heavy periods. On the other hand, sometimes during insertion of the IUD, a small hole is made in the lining of the uterus, and the IUD finds itself outside of the uterine cavity. This is referred to as a perforation. Lastly, we have pelvic infection. So during insertion of the IUD, organisms can be introduced into the uterus, causing an infection. In fact, women at high risk of STIs should be offered STI screening prior to IUD insertion. Okay, so now what about the contraindications? So first of all, we should avoid inserting an IUD between 48 hours and 4 weeks postpartum. We should definitely not insert an IUD if we have unexplained vaginal bleeding. The necessary investigations need to be performed first. If you're unsure about exactly what investigations should be carried out, you can check out one of my videos on abnormal uterine bleeding. Now, an IUD cannot be inserted also in the presence of a molar pregnancy or cervical cancer. We should also avoid inserting an IUD if the uterine cavity is majorly distorted in some way, such as submucosal fibroids or a uterine anomaly. Another contraindication is also current pelvic inflammatory disease. So these that we've mentioned are contraindications for both the copper and hormonal IUD. Now some differences. So a hormonal IUD is contraindicated in someone with current breast cancer and should be avoided with a history of breast cancer, whereas there is absolutely no problem with the copper IUD. Remember this for your exams. All hormonal contraception is contraindicated in the patient with current breast cancer. The copper IUD is the best option for these patients. Now with liver disease, we should avoid using a hormonal intrauterine system, but a copper coil is fine, and the same can be said for SLE as well. Next up, I'll be doing another video to continue this discussion on intrauterine contraception, including the insertion technique. Like and subscribe!